Please rise in body or spirit for the reading of the gospel. The first selection is from Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And then from John 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went over up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, Thanks be to God. So we are officially halfway and a day through our series, Seeing Ourselves in the Twelve. Andrew is a unique disciple in some ways. Because, as Anne has shared and Pastor Alice, many of our disciples have multiple names. Andrew's only other identifier is Simon Peter's brother, which leads me to believe he's probably maybe the younger sibling, if any of you younger siblings out there have ever been identified by your older sibling. Ah, this is Megan's sister. Hi, I'm Megan's sister. And with that, He's also part of several key moments that typically it would just be reserved for James and John and Peter. Could it be nepotism? Peter just says, oh, my brother will be with us. Who knows? But he's present at some of the healings and some of the moments that other disciples were not. Andrew's also known as the first called. 
And this is a little confusing because, again, our Gospels tend not to have very linear and organized call stories. The one you heard from today is the most well-known. Peter and Andrew are in their fishing boat. Jesus comes along and says, hi, come and follow me. And they're like, absolutely. And we see no other reason except that they follow Jesus. Well, in John's gospel, we learn that it's, to believe, it's believed that Andrew was one of the two disciples of John the Baptist who go to Jesus and say, who are you? And Andrew says, you are the Messiah. So Andrew is the first disciple to name Jesus as the Messiah. And then he goes and gets Peter, his brother, and brings him to Jesus. And Jesus calls him Peter the Rock. And so we see that without Andrew... We wouldn't have that wonderful, eager to answer, eager to question Peter. He brings in his brother. We're also told that Andrew is from the same town as Philip, Bethsaida. So whether we know of Philip and Peter and Andrew knowing each other prior to becoming apostles, it's not totally clear, but it's not unlikely and Philip, at one point, is greeted by the Greeks. It's all we know of them. They're the Greeks, and they ask to speak to Jesus. Now, Philip could have gone to Jesus on his own, but he goes and gets Andrew. And Andrew then, and together, they go and tell Jesus. And Jesus names what is about to happen to him. And so it appears that Andrew is this trusted individual. Andrew is also present when Jesus proclaims the destruction of the temple, his foretelling of his death and resurrection. And it's Andrew and a crowd that, again, Philip is part of the story today that is, how are we supposed to feed all these people? And Andrew goes, well, see, like, there's this little kid over here. He has five barley loaves and two fish, but what is that? And again, I'm pretty sure I, I preached a sermon where it was like, Andrew stole this kid's lunch. But we don't know that. But the thing that's interesting today is, in reading it, I realize Andrew's the only one who maybe saw that kid. It's so easy to ignore children, especially in mass crowds, because we assume another adult will be tending to them. And if in a large crowd, how did you see the little guy? I assume he's little because it said a child, right? That has five barley loaves and two fish. So we see that Andrew's an observer, a connector. And as far as the gospel writers have noted, he was good being known as Simon Peter's brother. So what does that mean for us today? as we see ourselves in the 12. Well, I think some of it is that Andrew knew who he was. He was grounded in himself enough to leave John the Baptist and go and follow Jesus, to bring his brother with him, to journey with Philip to tell Jesus that there were a group of Greeks that wanted to meet with him, bold enough to ask tough questions about what Jesus meant. And so I think for all of us, sometimes we want to be something we are not. But hopefully from Andrew, we can learn that we are just what we need to be ourselves. And that each and every one of us has a role to play in this gospel work. How many of you, let's be real, it's church work, you all know these people, who are kind of in the backgrounds on the sides, but they get the stuff done, right? They may never be the person whose name's printed, who has a title, but they are the people who just make it happen. But they're also totally okay with it. There's no, like, 
ego trip of, but what about me? What about me? They're like, nah, I'm good. You best not put my name in print. I like my spot. They are comfortable with who they are, and they see the vitality of what they do. They remind me of the amazing connectors in our lives. The people who, when you get to talking to them, they go, oh my goodness, you need to meet so-and-so, you all will be great, you need to know this ministry, it would match your passion, and they tend to just connect you, right? In social work, we call them our community organizers, the people who can see the gifts and skills and go and do. And that's Andrew. He observes, he sees, he makes possible, right? I think something else that we can learn from Andrew and how we see ourselves is part of that observing means we have to actually see each other. We have to know each other. And we have to see value in each other. And being able to be seen and known and valued is really unsettling. It's the thing most of us long for, but the thought of actually having to be known, well, what if they don't like me? Or what if they learn this about me? Will they still accept me? There's a vulnerability to being known, even though it's something we long for. And yet, to be known is what allows us to be stronger together. It allows us to see the beauty within ourselves, and it allows us to be able to remind each other of our value when we can't see it in ourselves. And so, following Andrew to observe means to see value in people that might get overlooked. Like a kid with a lunch. Five barley loaves, two fish to see value, to see abundance, to see possibility. I think we also can learn from Andrew that we have to be able to speak up. He asks Jesus, when Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, what do you mean, what is coming? He doesn't sit back, he asks the hard questions, and sometimes hard questions can feel like conflict, so we avoid them. We don't want to be somebody who's seen as the rebel rousing rift raft. But let's be real, it's the people who ask the hard questions that allow change to come. They're the people who say, the status quo is not what I want. What does this look like? But they hold their question with open hands, not certainty. They simply say, what about this? And then allow it to come and explore. Andrew did that. Even with the barley loaves of, and fish, like he was like, here's what we got, but what are we gonna do with it? He already second guessed his offer. How many of you do that where you're like, well, I'm gonna try this, but no, ah, there's too many realistic issues with what I'm about to offer. And so we settle into realism real quick, and we ignore creativity and possibility, right? Because I don't want to be considered a fool. I don't want to be the one who's like, yo, Andrew, five barley loaves, two fish. It was worse than when we had nothing. Like, dude, now who's going to get the five barley loaves and two fish? But Jesus does something with it. He says, go and gather and share. And again, we don't know if Jesus multiplied it. All we know is by the end of it, there were 12 baskets left over. And all because Andrew initiated a possibility. Now, could Jesus have still done it without Andrew? I'm going to say yes, because he's Jesus. But the way the story is told, they note that it's Andrew who sees the child. And in a world that often tells us that's not going to work, that's not realistic, Andrew reminds us that sometimes it's the random questions or notes of possibility that bring about abundance. And in a world where we are taught that we do not have enough or that 
the gap between the wealthy and the poor keep growing, it can feel like, what's the point? We have to function in realism. I'm going to say we function in realism a lot, and it doesn't seem to be doing all that much good. So maybe we add a little bit of possibility in there, like Andrew. And if we get called foolish, that's okay. Let's see what happens. There have been some great fools throughout history who have made things come about. And so with Andrew, we see this steadfast presence of somebody who is comfortable in who they are, willing to see other people for who they are, and to trust that the Spirit of God, the teachings of Jesus, and the creation of God allows us to see possibility where there is none. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty great way to see ourselves in the twelve. Every role is needed, not just the ones with title or those that are out front. You being known is needed for the gospel to become fully embodied. The gospel is not complete without each and every one of you. And who you are is who you need to be. And that doesn't mean you don't grow or change or learn, but at your very core, your belovedness is exactly who you need to be. Because the gospel needs each and every one of us so that justice and love and peace and grace can be embodied in all that we do. Andrew did some really beautiful things. We are told after the canonization text that there's the Acts of Andrew did not get canonized, some consider it heretical. Read at your leisure. But it tells of who Andrew was and what he did. He is considered the um, saint of the Ukraine and Russia and Romania because he went and did and made sure people were taken care of. We are told that at his death he was crucified but he said, I cannot be crucified the way of Christ because I am not worthy. And so he was crucified in an X instead of at a cross. And throughout his whole life, he had this humble nature. He didn't shy away from difficult things. He continued to meet people where they were at and invite them into this important work. But he wasn't showy. He wasn't his brother Peter. And if any of you know family dynamics, that's really tricky sometimes when you're not Peter or your other known name is the brother of Peter. And yet he lived exactly who he was. My prayer for each of us is that we can live exactly who we are. Because anything else is extra work. Anything else is not true. And let's be honest, God created you with intentionality. God doesn't need you to be anybody but you. The gospel, justice, need each of you to be yourselves. So what are your five barley loaves and two fishes? The things you see as not being enough that God can use and use abundantly. What are the things that you dismiss as not showy enough that God says, that's exactly what we need? What are the things keeping you from being known by others? Because the reality is the gospel needs people who feel safe enough to boldly work for the kingdom here on earth. And to do that, we have to feel secure. And to feel secure, we have to feel known, to feel seen, and to be valued. What will help you live into that security so that the gospel can be known more in this lifetime, in this moment, in this season? 
how might we feed 5,000 with what we have? Likely working together because none of it can be done alone. Even Christ knew that. So let us do this work together, just as we are. For God created you with intentionality, and God has done good work with each and every one of you. Let us go forth, proclaiming our belovedness and bringing about justice in all that we do. Amen.